Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. Your hosts today are me, I'm Jason. And I'm Travis, regular co-hosts. We connect with all sorts of different people, TOs, uh, competitive players, and just um, anyone else that has something interesting to say that they message us and convince us to talk about on an episode. Yeah, we do like making the world a little bit smaller, one hobbyist at a time. We do have a Discord and a Patreon, which is definitely some stuff that you should check out if you enjoy our content. And if you do enjoy this podcast, make sure to share it with your friends who play Kill Team, because the more the merrier. I am not going to ACO. One of your um, players but, uh, is coming. Yes. Uh, Andrew is coming. Andrew. Oh, uh, he, ping, he pinged me to ask some questions. So, And then he was like, oh, yeah, William is or Will is running a tournament soon. I was like, oh, yeah, I've already <laughs> he's already on on the list. Yeah, Andrew's a, a good guy. He's um, he's kind of he's jumped into our, our meta probably since I want to say December. And uh, he's he's really good. He's picked it up fast. I hope he goes to ACO and does really well and is kind of able to see the bigger meta and see what it kind of looks like. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, he's he's a good player. Yeah, and you've got Jesse up there too. And Jesse's been kind of out and about for the, I think, almost the entirety of the edition. Yeah, so Jesse is, uh, I like to refer to him as the mayor of Kill Team Town up here in New England. Um, he's, he's incredible. When I, when I got into the game, he, um, he was instrumental on not only kind of pointing us in some directions to some resources and kind of what to look for, but also just an incredibly, uh, kind, uh, a really great player himself. Um, really fun hobbyist too. Like he really comes after some really cool projects. Um, like for the winter, he played all compendium teams. Uh, he put like he was playing tyranid warriors on 50 millimeter bases and you know like driving himself nuts but yet having a really great time doing it so um yeah he's awesome big vibes well i think jesse is the primary person that's come down from the new england area down to the new york scene for our monthlies from time to time and then obviously a couple players have gone up and then we had Mandy on here, I think, in the middle of last year to talk about Cadian or like the Kasserkin and just a little bit about the New England scene. And I think she's also in around your community. Yeah. Yeah. Mandy runs. So and I can talk a little bit more about kind of more about this, but uh, Mandy runs uh, Norton, which Norton is there's probably kind of three places to play kill team in New England right now. There's a fourth one kind of coming on the scene. Um, in Massachusetts, but they're very, they're still quarterly. So Norton, Massachusetts, which is battlegrounds, Norton is run by Mandy and she, uh, they run a monthly tournament there. Um, we run two monthly tournaments in Maine right now, um, which I'm part of both of those. We run one at Phyrexian life games, which is in Scarborough, Maine, which if you know where Portland, Maine is, it's, it's just, it's a probably about ooh, five to 10 minutes South of Portland, Maine. And then where we started our main meta was uh, a really cool shop called Pints and Ponds, um, which is is a a gaming bar, essentially, the gaming bar space. So they run a Kill Team tournament as well. Um, Derek was instrumental in kind of getting us started um, in Maine, especially. And so now we kind of have three three times to play in in New England, which is really fun. Um, We went from Norton having about probably like six to 10 to now we have probably I'd say in the greater New England area, probably about 20 to 30 players um, traveling between those three stores, which is pretty fun. Yeah, that's nice. Great. And we did it in less than nine months, <laughs> which yeah, is amazing. the real crazy part. So like so. between the 20 to 30 players, like how many people show up to each tournament? Yeah, great question. Um, we I would say we get uh, about eight to 14 um, per event. So I think one of the challenges that we we've had recently is, is magic. The gathering seems to keep making, uh, too many cards. Um, and I know Travis is probably pretty excited about that because I know he's a magic guy, but, um, but certainly I think, uh, one of the challenges has been hard to find, uh, days that we can all kind of have events and not compete with each other. Um, we've made it a point for all three gaming spaces to try our best not to compete with each other so that everyone can kind of travel back and forth. But even still, um, we're getting about 
you know, we just had an event this past week at Phyrexian Life Games in Scarborough. We had, I think, 13 people signed up. And then at the end of it, we had 10 people play, which was pretty good. Um, and then we had Norton the weekend before, which I want to say was 12 players. So we get about, you know, 10 to 14, which has been pretty good. Pretty good turnaround, actually. Yeah. And, and you've got the- three, you've got like three separate communities all kind of playing and having their own little individual metas and their own individual little team captains, kind of. So having the interplay is probably fun. Have you guys thought about doing kind of a traveling tournament between your three stores? Not a tournament, a league, basically, where people can, you know, play at all three stores? Because that could be a fun way to mix it up. I think so. I think we would, what we, We've talked about a, a league, a, a league, a kind of summer league might be fun. Um, the nice thing that we have right now is trying to get, well, the real thing is trying to get folks to travel. And I think one of the challenges that we have in New England, especially, is that between our main locations, which are about 30 ish minutes apart from each other, and um, Norton, Massachusetts, it's about two and a half hours. So um, what we're trying to do is is try to get folks to carpool um, to the different tournaments. Um, So if they miss, we try to make Norton kind of a primary because it's the only one in mass. So uh, myself, uh, one of my good friends who got me into kill team, Zach D and I will travel down. We offer up car space. We'll go down and then vice versa. So Jesse will bring up some guys um, and we kind of get that back and forth. The untapped market for new England right now is, is New Hampshire. So we have um, a, 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 a kind of growing group out of New Hampshire. They're not running events, but they're coming to our two, kind of our three spaces. And um, so it's it's trying to capture those guys and get them to play. And what's been really fun too is also we're getting some folks from kind of northern Massachusetts um, towards the New Hampshire line as well, who will kind of go back and forth. Yeah, that's cool. So with all of the the growth of the scene, has that mostly been revolving around? organizing tournaments or do you have like a casual game night um we've kind of seen a couple different formulas it sounds like you're mostly like tournament based though is that is that true yeah we would say that we're more tournament based and and that's because uh 40k still you know holds a lot of space um and our especially here in maine and so what that you know we try to kind of pair ourselves with 40k um and those gaming nights and so we're able to get some of those nights but we have a pretty good community here in maine on discord and we try to get you know set up some games um on tuesday and wednesday night of two different stores and then uh pints and ponds kind of has folks kind of play throughout the week which is great um and but tournaments become our really big focus and i think that comes from my my experience with with gaming itself and and organizing itself has always been around tournament play and so it's a great way for folks to obviously the competitive play part is always fun but it's a good way for folks to kind of meet each other and know know each other um in a in a kind of easier space and then at that point kind of break off and be able to kind of set up games um i try to set up uh multiple games a week with multiple different players um as much as possible um I'm going to run out of some of that time coming up here pretty soon, but uh, <laughs> um, I'm certainly hopeful that uh, I can kind of keep promoting that in in our community and keep growing as we move kind of into the summer months. Yeah, I mean, the Northeast region is going to have a lot of upcoming tournaments. You know, we have Atlantic City Open in June. You're running Iron Weld at the beginning of June, I think June 1st, 2nd. Yep. And then we'll have Goonhammer in July, which will be, I think, I think early July, July 7th, I believe. And then later, you know, the New York Open, we finally penned our contract. So for anyone who's listening, who's interested in coming to the New York Open, we don't have the website set up yet, but it'll be in October 26, 27. So lots of lots of ticket events and lots of big tournaments. So hopefully all of that excites people. We we also I, I can more information to come, but we are. Uh, planning to run another GT level size event, 32 players here in Maine um, in November. And it is not competing with uh, the awesome New York Open. We're going to go earlier in the month um, is our plan. Um, I want to, I'm just pulling it up on our calendar right here. It was, our dates are uh, two to be determined, but it's either going to be the 9th or the 16th. Um, More information to come about that for our event side, but we're really excited to try to run some more events in New England as much as possible and, and be in the greater space um, as, as we kind of build our, our communities. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, running tournaments is an easy way to kind of build up our initial communities, but then there's also plenty of other ways to build up the 40k and kill team communities. I know on the West Coast, Dakota is really big onto the painting side. From the pictures you've posted in our group chat right here, it seems like you basically have all the teams. And it sounds like coming over from 40k, you had a lot of experience collecting and building large armies. So kind of walk us through how that process is. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, my my experience in the game has been long. I've been uh, around Warhammer 40k, particularly since since 2000. My brother played growing up um, and then that got me into the hobby. Um, and then as time went on, I built models, uh, assembled models. My first big army was Imperial Guard. Um, so I remember all the, you know, putting those pieces together and the old Lehman Russ kits and all that together. And as time went on, I kind of built on that. And so um, I played all the way through to, um, from third edition to sixth edition, kind of took a break in seventh and then came back in eighth. And 40K, uh, you know, playing Warhammer 40K, it's especially on a competitive side. And I can share more about that. My experience in that is that you have to have these massive armies that are, you know, three, 400 models in some cases. I played uh, in my main run for competitive play in ninth edition, I played Imperial Guard, Tyranids, and Death Guard. And Death Guard was my lowest model count. And I think I was still in the 200 model count range with all my pox walkers and everything that was there. Um, so I think one of the challenges is like, how do you manage that and look at that? And I think from the 40 K side and then how that kind of applies to kill team is that, you know, I just made sure I knew what I needed. Um, uh, so I would, you know, build my kits out and kind of assemble those out. Um, I was really particular about my painting and making sure that everything was painted to a level that someone five feet away from the table would say, that's okay. (laughs) Um, following up painting standards and then um, using a lot of tricks. So um, I really like using the GW contrast paints and the speed paints. Um, I really like to use their basing mediums too, which makes basing really, really easy and quick. Um, I think there's a lot of strategies to make your models look even more incredible um, as you go. But when I came over to Kill Team from 40K, uh, I set the challenge for myself that I would I would work harder on my painting. So before, because I had so many models, it, it really, you know, I just had to have them battle ready so that I wouldn't get deducted points when I go, went to tournaments. And then when I came to Kill Team, I, I said, well, I only have 12 models, so I'm going to take my time with it and really kind of assemble models, look at what I want to do with them, paint them, and each time try something new and a different paint strategy um, and painting technique. Right now, I'm using a lot of, um, I really like the slap chop method and then using a lot of, utilizing the texture paints, especially the blood paints. Uh, I'm I'm finishing up Nemesis Claw right now, um, and I've converted them from Corn Berserkers, um, and utilizing a lot of blood paints with that has been really, really fun. But I think one of the big, big things I would tell anyone in in hobbying especially is hold on to your bits. Um, that is like one of the coolest things ever is that you can start a project and go, oh, I think I kind of want to start it there. And then as you start to work through it, you go, oh, I really need a plasma rifle or, oh, I really need this or this. And then, you know, kind of taking that time to go through your bits and you can have a really fun and creative project at the end. Um, so I would suggest take your time, have fun with it and, um, and show off your models to your friends. Um, it's really fun. Yeah. That's, um, that's actually really interesting. And we've never really chatted that much about like hobby techniques, but I'm, you know, not to put you super on the spot and, and I can clip this if need be, but how would you explain slap chop to someone that's never heard of it in like 20 seconds? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so first off, start off with really good spray paint. Um, I would highly suggest Army Painter or GW spray paint. If you can get GW spray paint, um, I would, if you're, then you want to spray paint it with a light coat of, of black spray paint in the case that I've been doing on my slap chops. Um, and then afterwards, you're going to use a, a dry paint. So uh, I, I really like the Citadel paints particularly. I've been using them for 24 years at this point. And I'm, I don't think I'm going to stop. So I would say um, you want to then use a gray dry paint over it. The brush you want to use is kind of a bigger brush 
um, just go for it. Just go right on over the model. You're going to cover that black paint, but you're going to leave some little kind of little points. You'll see them in the creases of the color as you go. Once you finish the gray, you're going to do the same thing, but with white. And the white really gives a nice contrast. And then once you have that done, you can apply contrast paint or a speed paint over it. Um, and because of that, it's going to add a little bit more depth to the color, which looks really, really nice. And the effect is really quick. So what you can end up doing is with that kind of that slap chop and using those contrasting colors, um, you know, you can finish a kill team in a, in a week easy, which yeah. is really fun. It is really incredible. And like for anyone that's never done this or like or is kind of intimidated by the painting that's listening, it, it really is just like, I mean, I get like giant brushes from the like giant makeup brushes from the dollar store. And then you kind of just like you dab it into the gray and they do like a quick smear like on your skin or on a paper towel or something to get the texture right. So that it like it kind of covers it, but like not super amazingly because and, and then if you just kind of like do quick strokes um, you, it really just ends with like, it, it catches the edges and you don't have to think or try that hard and it works really amazingly. And then the same thing with the white, with the, the paintbrush being a little bit even more dry than that. Um, and it's, it's so much easier than it sounds and it looks so good. Um, I'm really, yeah, it's, it's cool to hear someone, um, explain it nicely like that. I, I got introduced to it, um. Uh... So in my, our community in, in Maine, especially, we have some incredible painters. Um, and uh, I'm thinking of my uh, two particular folks right now, Brookie and, and Nate, that have given me a lot of suggestions through the years. Um, but when I was playing 40K, I, I, I would hear their, their suggestions and just never apply them because I just didn't have the time to do so. Um, when you're getting 30, you know, 30 Tyranid warriors ready for the table, you couldn't really take the time. Um, so I think what I've been trying to do is to apply that now and, and slap chop is one of the best ways to do that. It, it makes you feel like a really great painter really, really fast. And you see that result and that depth, which is really fun. And I think, but the big thing I would say is that you can apply the same kind of concept. So as I talk about that black paint, you can change that around to a gray paint if you wanted to, but, uh, it, it's a little bit harder to do. Yeah, for my part, I've been using some version of this for the last couple of years, basically using contrast paints as a tint on whatever your undercoat is. So my mandrakes that I don't know if anyone watched our YouTube video when we did our mandrakes review, that scheme was done with contrast paints and underpainting and basically a light version of slap chop just to get initial highlights. And then I'd layer up after I do the contrast paints just because it gives you a nice working layer and you can stop there, which I think a lot of people do stop there for slap chopping, but you can just use as a base coat for you to do the traditional layering up that GW likes to push. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the other thing too, the slap chop that's, I think really great is, is the basing. So I think basing is another big element too. So it, because it adds that depth really quickly, your base can be really easy to put together and really continue to add that depth to the model. Um, so as I, you know, I'm looking at a project right now as I'm finishing here. Um, in my case, uh, you know, you could, I put some these these particular models on some cork rocks and some things like that, filled in with sand. And then it's easy to, to apply. In this case, I, I put blood paint over that, the blood for the blood god paint. Um, definitely tell everyone to buy that in their, and put that in their hobby hobby kit. It's, it's wonderful. Um, but then uh, applying some simple shrubs and some color onto the rocks, and then you're done. And it really kind of adds that whole thing together and makes it really look nice. Um, I guess, you know, we've talked a little bit about the hobbying side. We probably want to get into some of the more in-depth miniature conversations because it seems like you have a little bit of everything as far as teams go but specifically the thing that drew us to <clears throat> drew you to our attention was your custodies conversions that you posted on our discord you posted i think a blood like a blood god themed custodies and we just kind of wanted to get into the headspace because it sounds like you've been having a ton of fun with them so what has drawn you to talents and talk to us a little bit about your blood god conversions Sure. Um, so uh, I played, uh, I thought my team for the, for the year was going to be Harlequins, uh, Void Dancer Troop. And then obviously we recently had our, uh, we had our recent data slate and kind of changed that. 
And um, so I kind of put them away and put them on the shelf. And since then, I've been playing a multiple of teams. I've been Hunter Clade. I've been playing um, Warp Coven. I've been playing Felgors and Commandos and kind of really trying to to play something and, and figure out what I wanted to do next. And I, and I really couldn't get the momentum there. And when I, the challenge I kept finding is that one of the things I really enjoyed about Harlequins was the ability to kind of get a double kill. And I couldn't find a team that really gave me the capacity to do so. And so, you know, kind of frustrated in that I was, I kind of said, well, maybe I'll just have a hobby project and, and try something different. And I've always wanted to build the eight bound kit. I, the eight bound kit for, um, World Leaders is this really great kit. I've seen it through the years for 40K. Obviously, in Kill Team, it doesn't, you know, there's no World Leaders army just yet. Um, so I was thinking, how do I apply that? And then I said, well, custodies, they'll be on 40s. So uh, I ended up buying, a, in this case, a, an eight bound kit, a custodies kit, um, particularly not the wardens, but the, the basic guys with shields and everything. So I can make a talents, full talents roster. And then I bought a possessed kit as well. I had some spare bits from that as well. And kind of as the week went on, I, you know, built the first two models and, um, with the eight bound kits, their, their legs are kind of, their chests are bare, their legs kind of have that corn berserker vibe to them. And, and I was like, Oh, this looks really good. And then as I applied the, you know, I did the spear on the first one and then had the, the guy kind of pointing out and kind of looking out. I said, yep, this, this will work. And, made sure that they the size wise kind of matched up and in some areas where some of the eight bound kits are kind of they're kind of kneeling over put them on rocks so that they would be up at, at the same height um so that they would kind of match that and and that was really fun in the kit bash there and so as i kind of applied them and, and built them I, I really wanted to paint them pretty fast and um i just had finished a corsairs kit um playing corsairs too trying to figure out what to play um, and I'd used the blood paint for the first time and, and really thought, well, oh, this is going to work. So as I built them out and I painted them and I was, I was feeling pretty good about it. When I got into kill team, um, not that long ago, I started with talons and I really enjoyed them and kind of walked away with them thinking that maybe other teams might be a better fit for me. And I, I feel that it might, that only time that that hasn't been, that has been the case has been harlequins and boy dancer troop just for how kind of lethal and how aggressive they played so with that being said i kind of pushed back into talents i started playing some practice games had some success and said maybe i'll try these out in the bigger community and then into some tournaments and um you know gone to two tournaments now and and i've gone um five wins one tie um and uh, zero losses on them so really enjoying them and hoping to continue to take them moving forward. I think the thing that Talons does that's really exciting is it does give you that high probability for those double kills, which is really fun. So they play that super aggressive play style that I think is really kind of missing sometimes in, in competitive play. Um, and so it can really kind of uh, players who have a really kind of specific plan and, and strategy that they're going to implement they're going to put that out there. And as they're doing that, and I can share my experience of playing Mandrakes, particularly recently with talents is that they have this plan, they're going to implement it, but they can't kill the talents because they're just so thick. Um, and if they come into the primary game, the talents are going to be there and be able to really be aggressive and push them off those objectives. So they, they play a hard, so the Mandrakes can play into this really aggressive uh, secondary game, but if they come into primaries, they're just going to get killed. So it's this really fun game as a as a talents player of saying, "Come at me and see what happens." And um, sometimes that can work really well. Sometimes it doesn't. But in the end, I think the aggressiveness uh, can really match other armies, even as a compendium team. Yeah, that's a great point. I actually love that a lot. Um, I'm a hundred percent the same way. I like to play like ridiculously aggressive. Um, my my first, I mean, I guess like the main like. I I was playing Compendium Intercessors. Um, I did like Imperial Fist because they just like they're dressed in yellow and they're like, "Come at me, bro!" Like I'm not trying to hide. <laughs> I've just got like a bolt gun and a fist. I'm gonna <laughs> just like stand out in the open and fight you. And and that's just kind of been like the vibe. Um, and then like my my uh, my joking version of the Imperial Fist 
Phobos Marines was in cursors that don't use conceal orders, and that actually turned into something, which has been really fun. Yeah, aggressive play. Love that. Yeah, I mean, the Custodies have some of the most powerful compendium rules in that they get no crit damage, injury bubbles coming off of the sisters, so you can mess up a lot of the melee combat steps, or even just a lot of the breakpoints, because an 11 wound operative on the sisters is pretty good because you always give them the five face plates because the three custodies or the two custodies can do whatever they need to already out of the box you don't need to baby them but the five cassette or the five sisters that you take they always have 11 wounds with a three up save with good melee profiles and you can hold cp for rerolls if need be so you end up with a very reliable team it is somewhat telegraph but sometimes telegraphing is fine when you're just playing seek and destroy or recon and just running at your opponent and stat checking them yeah, and I, I, I tend to play Seek and Destroy. And I'm I definitely I think my community knows what's you know, what especially from practice games into tournament play of what I'm going to be playing, particularly for my tech ops and, and what that's gonna look like, but I'm okay with it because I think it does force a play, um, a type of play that, you know, my opponent has to be worried about it. One of those cases is that I end up often taking headhunter and I'm hoping to score one point out of it. And the benefit that I see out of doing that is that even in that case of only scoring one point out of it, the the benefit is that their leader has to play much more cagey. And so if they decide to kind of move into the space, they have to they have to know confidently that they're going to kill a custody. So if you're playing a nemesis claw matchup or any kind of plasma pistol matchup, particularly, you got to make sure that you kill that you drop the custody when you come in. And if you don't, then the trade-up is going to be really challenging. And so it, it ends up forcing players to, again, kind of playing away from the custodies, which is great because then they can play the primary game really, really well. Um, moving a custody off of a point is, is just really challenging. And then I think the other piece of it, too, that I've really enjoyed is the Sisters game. And I'm, I'm talking a lot about Nemesis Claw right now and, and Mandrix, I think, um, I think we're seeing a lot of them in a lot of people's meadows, but ours particularly in, in the Northeast in, in New England, we're seeing a lot of Mandrakes and uh, Nemesis Claw. One of the great things with the sisters matchup is that they have the potential to the break point of if you roll well, if rolling two five ups, you have that potential of kind of dropping everyone but the lightning claw guy. Um, who's reducing damage by one, which is 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 really scary. So if you're a Nemesis Claw player, you're like, well, I can go charge the sister, and I'm only really doing one damage on the first swing because I'm going to reduce damage um, to minimum, probably four. I'm going to use my plate, so I'm reducing it now to one. They're going to strike me back for a crit, so now I'm at six. I'm going to strike again, so again, I'm now they're at five, and then I strike back, and, and I'm potentially killing and that trade up is phenomenal. And so I think one of those things is that it certainly is very typecast, but man, it scares players to come up. So, um, and it pushes, it allows you to play so aggressive, which is phenomenal. Yeah. So I, I'm curious about like, do you ever take four custodians or is it always 100% two and five with the yeah, five that's sisters? A- yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, kind of a mix, to be honest. So when I built my custodies, particularly, um, I built uh, in the picture that it doesn't do them well because they've, they've been changed a little bit since then. But the five sisters were initially three um, three power swords, uh, one bolter, one flamer. The flamer has been cut. Um, so I have a bolter in there. Um, the bolter is probably getting cut and getting to another. So it'll go to five swords, but with the custodies themselves, there's three shields, three uh, spears. And so if I ever decide to play the four, I can never play just four shields or four spears. And the reasoning that I decided on that is that the shield does provide some really good tech pieces, um, particularly in kind of bullying uh, melee teams that are going to come at the custody models and kind of, kind of come at the talons. Um, I, generally play the five sisters and then two talons in into the dark hundred percent of the time always on open board i tend to play i tend to play usually four um four custodies and i will go to go to the talons if it's a loot situation or i'm playing commandos or something like that 
But the the thing that I'm finding with the four is that it really limits the opportunity for the players to do a seek and destroy unless they have plasma gun or something like that. Um, so it really limits their opportunity to do that. And so then they have to push into like a recon or an infiltrate. And if they do security, it's that's going to be really great for talents. In beta decima, this is going to sound very strange, but I play always four custodies on beta decima. So if I'm playing Into the Dark, always sisters, uh, open board, it's kind of a mix. And then beta, it's always four. And the reason why is they they can cover so much ground on the gantries and and really bully players to stay back. You have to play a really conservative game, but the nice pieces is, is that because again, there you kind of can get some nice line of sight blocking pieces in there and and some some elements to kind of keep your custodies alive, so that if they want to come up and melee, they're going to have a hard time. If they want to shoot, you're staying and conceal until the to the moment you don't need to anymore, and you can charge or get into that melee and they probably don't have enough firepower to kill you. So then you end up having maybe two custodies in their, on their side of the table, and they can't really do anything about it, um, which is really great. So like with the four custodies on Beta Decima, do you take the swords and shields at all, or is it like all spears? I take, um, because of my build, because I have three and three, um, I always take uh, three spears and one uh, shield, and the shield I generally make my leader. So, um, again, a kind of typecast, if you want to took a headhunter or you have a particular type of, you know, tack op that you're going after the leader or what have you, but, um, it just kind of allows him the ability to, to run up and kind of force that the spears are really great too. Um, I think on beta decima, particularly the overwatch potential is really strong. Their shooting is really strong. I think one of the things that I keep having experiences with against opponents and they're talking about afterwards is i didn't expect your shooting to be so good so one of the problems with the shield is that minimum range of six is tough and you you have a bolter profile with p1 but it's still three four that three five is phenomenal on the spears with p1 you can really do some hard some good work yeah hitting on twos and p1 is like an insane combo like almost regardless of the damage and then three five really just like pushes it over the edge it's like honestly i i feel like the the spear custodian shooting is like better than most plasma profiles in the game especially because you have access to double shooting and yeah. and they can just like stand out the open and shoot fearlessly um it's it's some of the best shooting that's out there honestly yeah, and I, I think too when you look at um, when you're setting up your 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 team and you're looking at equipment, if you go for custodies, so if you go sisters, you're going all all plates. So you're going all face plates and calling it a day. It's it's just too good not to take. But when you're looking at a four custody list, there's kind of two equipment choices you can go with. But I think generally the right one is to go three oath parchments, and there'll be that time to roll that one. Um, and it's great on a burn for, for a shoot or, um, I tend to use it for a shoot, a shooting attack or a melee attack versus a save. Um, just because I know I'm, I'm taking min damage already and I'm trying to utilize cover as best as possible. So, you know, to really extra push that damage through, um, that's what I tend to do. And it's great. The other loadout that I sometimes run is two oath parchments, two misericordias, but recently I played a, a interesting a, a, the misericordia. Can you tell our listeners what the misericordia does? Cause I'm almost a hundred percent sure that even the players who play towns of the emperor do not use this equipment. So lay, give, yeah. give us, give us the, give us the rewind. Yeah. So, and I can give you a really funny, uh, so I, I talked about in my recent play experience, um, five, uh, five wins, one tie, one tie came down to a misericordia. Um, so the Miscordia is each time after the operative fights in combat, you can use this ability. You roll a D six on a three plus, um, the operative, the operative you are fighting takes, uh, two mortal wounds. It, it's what's really, it's tough because the oath parchment generally a, a reroll is always usually better, but what ends up happening is you get in these kind of stuck in combats in particular cases, um, and I look at more towards elites and it, particularly intercessors, uh, Phobos, Legionnaires to some capacity, Nemesis Claws. A little, I'm going to probably go all Oath Parchments, but um, you have those ones where some you just have a terrible role. You get stuck in and maybe you can kind of slash out and, and finish out the combat on that. It's very nice at the late game. 
recently I was in the tournament. Uh, first round, I played a, a player in our, our local New England, a very good Phobos player, has, has won a couple of events region, regionally in our, in our locals. And uh, we ended up uh, tying because the Miss Gordy, I rolled a, a two on it and I didn't do the two mortal wounds. And so I left his Phobos guy on two mortal on two wounds. And uh, but it was the difference between tying and winning by one. Um, it, I would say give it a try. Give it a try in your equipment. Um, you're probably just going to go back to Oath Parchments or if you're playing Sisters, go to the, the plates. But give it a try and see if you like it and if it works. Um, sometimes it's nice into commandos as well. I actually love that. Um, we're definitely birds of a feather. I love your crazy, like you're thinking on your own. It's aggressive play style. It's it's bold. I love it. It's that's I mean, I've been thinking about like trying to dabble in talents for a long time. And right now I'm feeling a little bit like lost. I was like, I'm going to take a break from elites. And uh, I'm like, I got to go back. And I'm really feeling the talents after this conversation. Um, so uh, f- for my sake and for all the listeners, when it comes to the sisters, you, you said you, you chopped off the bolt gun. It wasn't really doing it for you. Um, tell me about your your preferred loadouts and the situations for the different sisters loadouts that you do and why. Sure. So sisters, I'm also going to add a little piece, piece of spicy tech in here that you're never going to use, except for maybe into Nemesis Squaw and into um, Warp Coven. But we'll, I'll get there in a second. So I, I, I tend to, I was running four sisters with power swords and one with bolter. And the reason that I was running the one with the bolter was I was making the one with the bolter, the leader. The, it's a bolter. It's nothing exciting. It is what it is. But what she was providing was kind of backline support. So she was, you know, scoring objectives in the back, particularly loot. Um, and she could, you know, if you're in the, into the dark, she can kind of set up plays with opening doors and things like that but she's not really pushing forward. Um, so she's kind of out of that, out of that space. The four additional sisters with, um, with power swords are phenomenal. You know, they're four, six profile lethal five plus like any power sword, but because of the faceplate equipment piece, you can get into these really, as Travis kind of alluding to is like your 11, your 11 health models that are, you're also taking minimum damage, which is really, really strong as a component. So you're, you're kind of putting those two pieces together. Now with, I would say I haven't ran into a warp coven player except for myself, um, you know, playing some, some practice games. I don't end up seeing too many warp coven players. Um, but I think nemesis claws become the new big thing. And especially with psychers, one of the things that the sisters do really well is kind of is denying, um, Oh gosh, I'm going to forget their two names. It's the leader's model. It's ability. And the, um, is it what's is it the uh the guy with the banner what's his name the anathema Ventrilo- the ventral equator the... or whatever yeah so both models are psychers and the visionary and, oh yes yeah. they are they are psychers they are both psychers and um with the banner particularly having the ability to pull you out uh can be really really challenging so what's really nice about the sisters is if you can get a good setup and I'll talk a little bit about talons and, and utilizing that in a second here is that they can be, you know, really shut down a really big play by both of them. Also, the leader's ability is a psychic ability of just, a, uh, they're just a scratch is a psychic ability too. So if you put a sister there into combat, you have a, you have a chance of kind of denying that as well, which is really nice. Another piece of really fun tech now, again, it, this you're going to drop one of your face plates to do this is a psych out grenade is kind of fun. So there's a the psych out grenade is for the sisters. It's it is terrible against anyone that isn't a psyker. Um, it's a one one damage uh, hits on threes, it's four attacks. But if you attack a psyker or a demon, it's a three five with lethal five plus. So, again, if you're into the into the dark setting, it can be really, really strong um, and it can kind of come out of nowhere, which is really nice. So like. If you can go four face plates, and in my case, I had my bolter, could throw grenade at that banner or at leader if if that came up, which was really fun. I think the other thing that's really great about the sisters is a particular tactical ploy, which is talons. So talons is kind of a group activation that sisters and custodies have together, but it is uh, very unique. And so how it works is. 
if a sister's model and a custodian's model are next to each other, um, within three of each other, and they're within six inches of a of an enemy operative or they're on an objective, um, they can group activate together. But how they activate is you can you essentially have five APL and you can go in any order you want, which is really great and into the dark. So if you have a particular setup where you get onto an objective or your opponent has opened the door and you're within six now. Um, what you can do is you have a really cool setup where you could have a sister um, charge and then you can have, um, you know, clear a path for the custody and the custody moves up. Maybe they charge, maybe they shoot, uh, or sorry, charge, they fight. And then if they kill, they can shoot afterwards. Because a lot of times in the Into the Dark and even on the open boards, you get these setups where you kind of can't get the, the 40 millimeter base of the custody around things. And so by utilizing talons, you can you can have a sister kind of clear the path for you and then get the model around, which is really fun. One thing I will say about the Nemesis Claws Night Lord Visionary is that the portent, the ability for you to just to scratch a die, is not a psychic action. So technically, the Sisters of Silence do not affect the important it is an ability that has no action rider attached to it it does stop premonition which is the cp gain oh okay. interestingly enough this is very clear raw that you can actually port in a way ahead which is interesting because you know it's obviously vibe wise the sisters of science should absolutely stop a portent but it turns out the portent was made during the strat phase <laughs> yeah that it's, it's that's just... that that's not to say that the other thing that you're talking about the tactical ploy talons is not a very unique ability especially on in the dark when there are doors and there's operatives that jam things up being able to mix your two activations is really powerful that 5 APL block that can include a sword sister and a custodian with a bolt a bolter with p1 and a big sword and all of the other stuff can allow you to clear rooms where your opponent really just is not ready for the amount of things that happen simultaneously and i'm sure that's a big part of getting the wins on in the dark when you have all of these extra actions that your opponent now has to think about all the time as long as you can keep your custody and your sisters of silence within three inches of each other yeah, it's it's between because you've got two custodians. Um, they each take a door with a sister, and then both of those become an absolute murder trap. And typically, with like two of those murder traps, it's like it's like a one way thing. You can pretty much like dominate the board. It's pretty. It's actually pretty insane. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So, um, oh, a quick recap on on that that first thing. So you always take four power swords. You did a bolt gun for a while, and now you traded it for a flamer. Is that? I'm yeah, I traded out. it for another another power sword just to have it in in the rotation because especially in Into the Dark Two, it, you know, when, once you start losing some of those sisters, you really the your your combat efficiency kind of you know pushes to other parts of the board, and you you really lose that effectiveness. And so, having five with swords has been, I think, is is the way to go. Um, though you do have to change kind of your thought process with your leader. So you, you know, you're kind of have to be mindful of the team that you're playing against. Is it a seek and destroy team? Is it an opponent that really enjoys taking headhunter or something like of that capacity? If that's the case, then I would move over and make your leader probably one of your big custody boys, um, instead. Yeah. Yeah. But it's so like power source is hundred percent the answer. Like don't bother with bolt guns. Uh, especially don't bother with flamethrowers. No, they're terrible. Gosh, they're terrible. Uh, I, I, in, in process of building it, I, I played one game with the flamer and finished the game and, you know, went home and immediately get the, the sprue cutters out and cut, <laughs> cut the flamethrower right off and Boated started digging off through the, the island the pit bucket and, uh, and got a power sword right on there right away. And I, I think too, it's, and I think that was the, Really fun thing that I'm really enjoying about Talons is that the team is really basic, right? So there there isn't really a lot to look at there, um, but it's it's worth giving everything a try because there isn't that many options. So you know, trying those those particular different options and and looking at you know, I, I think one of those two things with the sisters is that like creeping dread, for instance, uh, as a strap play, it can be phenomenal but it's hard to kind of set up too as well. So like you have to really kind of 
you know, there's a lot of turns where you, you have a, you're out in open board and it might be a mix of the five sisters and, and two custodies. In that case, they're probably spears and the custodies with spears just have a really good time shooting and then are really effective. And because of that, the creeping dread doesn't really come up. So like it, it's worth keep trying things because again, the pool is very shallow, um, but they're really fun to play. And I think the complexity is, is seeing what your opponent does and how they're trying to solve your problem rather than you trying to solve their problem. Yeah, I think being able to focus in on your rules and applying your rules in the correct place is a really big part of leveling up as you get better as a player. And compendium teams are definitely a good spot to do it. I think I know, Jason, you've been mucking around with some compendium guard recently. And I know one of our longtime listeners is been a big Talons fan for a long time. And he likes to say that he can use it to basically apply the best best operatives at the right time. I do think that eventually you want to play a bespoke team that has high power levels where you can do that and also abuse a bunch of the rules. But it does take a while to get there. And Talons are definitely good enough to do it just because raw power wise, they've got they've got the stats, they've got the checks and they've got the ploys to make sure your opponents are always sweating. Yeah. And like and honestly, a lot of these compendium teams like it's a kill team is a game that's like complex enough that really really getting extremely good at the fundamentals will take you a long way so like compend that makes the compendium surprisingly valid and yeah i mean i just just throw that as out long there. as your compendium team has is hitting the right power level then i think it is perfectly fine to play them i know we've had high fleet on here before because high fleet has got a good mix if you can take the whole 20 man roster you apply the operatives at the right time and you get some skew matchups which is great Custodies also can do skew matchups. Compendium Guard can also do skew matchups. Just taking four AP2 guns is very powerful, especially if you think that there is any number of appreciable elites in your game because you can load up on all the APL and have six operatives, all with AP2 and AP1 guns with reroll ones, all with one extra APL. So they're all uh, moving an extra seven inches, dashing, and then blowing up a dude pretty hard it just depends on the matchup and if you can know how to set your team up to apply those things at the right time it is always going to be rough because at the end of the day if you're not letting your opponent roll dice it doesn't really matter and that's why the custodies storm shields are so powerful because it doesn't really matter what your opponent is rolling in melee steps if they miss one time they're only getting in the one hit in any combat step basically and i'm sure you've gotten a lot of use out of that right will i have i i really the storm shields, I think one thing that really catches players is how the how that parry mechanic works. And so I think when they you look at it, that can be a really one of the things where they're they're not prepared for. That that double parry is just can be really shut things down really quick. Um, especially with your crits on your on your parries out too, which is was was really, really nice. And I think I think too, uh uh, having played, uh, I can't say that I've played for Kill Team. This is, I'm almost, I'm at 10 months, which is phenomenal to say, um, of playing this game. But as I look at it and, and, and really playing the, a variety of teams and, and experiences, I think it's, I think it's the big thing that for, from my experiences and as I try to build community in, in my area is, is telling folks just, you know, play the team that you like and have, have the most fun with. And, I think what's really, really been great is that the compendium teams, some of them, like, right, like Guard and, and High Fleet and Talons to some extent, you know, have that. But I have a player in my community that plays the uh, Tau Crisis. Not Crisis, it's the... Um, Stealth Suits. Oh, gosh. Stealth Suits. Yeah. And he knows he's going to lose every game by a million points, right? Um he is. And yes. they are just absolutely terrible. But... For him though, he 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 found that the hobby part was really fun. He he was able to kind of 3D print all these like pieces of them as like the models look like they're materializing. He was able to apply these really cool UV paints to them and all this. And I think he's excited to show them off in a casual play and say, Hey, I'm gonna get destroyed, but I'm gonna have fun playing this. But it's also fun too, is is to say, Well, what is that team you're gonna play that is more competitive? And for him, um, he picked Navy Breachers. And so I think it's what's really fun about kill team is because the, the, the teams are so inexpensive comparative to 40 K 
you can have your kind of, you can have your cake and eat it too, right? You can have your terrible Tau team, but you can also have Navy Breachers who are pretty solid, you know, mid-range team. What is this Tau player's name? His name's Adam. Um, I'll see if I can get a picture of his, uh, oh, they're not in stealth suits. Um, he did a phenomenal job. Really, really right. cool. Hold on. Just for Adam. If Adam is listening to this later in the future, this one's for you. If you want to play Stealth Suits and Compendium Tau, there is exactly one line of attack that makes sense. And it is two Stealth Suits. You replace your lead. You replace one of the Stealth Suits with two drones. And then you take Pathfinders. If you take Pathfinders and you have your leader on the Pathfinders, you get one extra model. And then you can replace one of those Pathfinders with a Recon Drone. You can have two more drones. From the stealth suit team, you have two stealth suits, you have five pathfinders. The one saving grace is that if you play against an elite team, you can take five photon grenades and stun the ever loving <laughs> shit out of all the space marines so they can't move. And you just run around and you doink your opponent with marker lights and you can make it work. It's just not very good. But if you are going to do it, you can actually have. I think 12 APL across the Pathfinder team and 8 APL on the Stealth Suit team. And that is just barely enough to be competitive. Is it good? Absolutely not. But if you want to go hard, you can shove all of your equipment onto a Stealth Suit leader. Give them the 5 foot field of pain. Give them the free mission action. Give them the target lock so that you get a reroll and have a really, really terrible Doom Guy Stealth Suit leader. Is it good? No. But it is probably the only way that I could theoretically make stealth suits work because if you take three stealth suits or six stealth suits god forbid you will lose one thousand percent of your games <laughs> i'm gonna say this is my favorite rant that i've ever heard from you uh you hadn't ever mentioned that like to me before and i love this <laughs> it is so something silly. that i have thought about so i thought ridiculous. about it in depth because when the game first came out i was looking at compendium teams and i pick Crute as the first one and I love the Crute team initially because it had a very unique flavor but you know as far as actually making the Tau work that I think that is the only way if you want to use stealth suits at all because having three stealth suits is not worth it but you can replace one stealth suit with two drones and the two drones are totally fine you can take a shield drone and a gun drone and a recon drone and that is a perfectly valid line of attack and there was someone that was talking about using uh, stealth suits but converting them into Phobos yeah uh, yeah someone said that that'd be that'd be really cool yeah i guess you could do that i think you'd probably need to jazz up the suits like make them shadow sun style suits but if you did that i would totally be fine with it i'd be very enthused i'm all about crazy conversions and stuff like that which you know like when you posted like any listeners that haven't seen this like join the discord and come look at these pictures of the 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 eight bound converted into custodies because they are so cool All right, Adam, best of luck on that one. <laughs> as far as uh, your, the rest of your scene, you know, you talked about in depth a little bit of custodies. You were playing Void Dancers for a while. Obviously, with the new data slate changes, Void Dancers maybe have taken a backseat. Interestingly enough, Void Dancers have not actually lost that much win rate on the week to week stats. So it might actually be that the the obituaries were written too soon. So maybe you could go back and find some use out of them, Will. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. I think but you'll so. always you'll always have it in your heart, the old way of playing Void Dancer. So it does feel like it's hard because you're going to always think about Fly, but the actual stories of Void Dancers falling to the wayside have not really come to pass on the week to week stats. Yeah, I've got I've got to do a real quick shout out um in one of like we've got a, a league that's running over here and I I played against a guy over here. Um he's he's a good dude. His name is Brian. He's playing Boy Dancers post nerf and he absolutely slapped the hell out of me like in the game. I was like, "Oh yeah, Boy Dancers post nerf. This will be fine." And then he's just like double kills, double kills. He's just like smiling. He's just being like the 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 best opponent ever he's he's fun he's cool he's slaying the hell out of me it was like the game opened up and like he he overextended and i killed two clowns with grenades and then he just butchered me in one like landslide i was like damn that was beautiful yeah it turns out the raw stats seem like they might be holding up i do not think that they have any legs at really deep tournament runs on like seven or eight rounds 
But for your casual three round, four round tournament, it does seem like there's still probably enough room for them to do well. Uh, yeah. So if anyone's still playing Boy Dancers, you know, come to our Discord and hit us up. Yep. Honestly, feel like the nerf. Uh, honestly, after that game, I was like, oh, that barely did anything to them. Like, they're still awesome. They can still jump in and like crit and strike and just like kill you without you swinging back. They can still like parry your hits away. They can do like all of their shenanigans, but they're a little bit less mobile. And it, it was it was kind of the same thing where it seemed so doom and gloom, but it's like, oh no, they still have three APL and they still are going to double kill you a lot. They just telegraph a little bit harder now, I think is the, the main worry. So really, really solid tournament players will be watching your movement ranges a lot better. And you really can't do quite as much as you could before, but you know the stats haven't changed. It's just the movement, which is a really big part of the game. It is. A big I don't know. Deal. Will have you actually gone back to try Void Dancers after the nerf, or was it the nerf happened and you moved on, and now you're enjoying Talon, so you just don't need to go back? So I, well, the the right before the the change, we had a we had a tournament um, here in New England at a. I can't remember the shop's name. It was they. It was their first kill team tournament, and they haven't really got going yet too much there. But the terrain was uh, very forty k esque, so it was really dense. And my last round opponent, I was playing void, void dancers and to high tech circle. And what ended up happening was I had I was able to just move up all my void dancers basically behind walls, um, and they were just going to be able to fly and do anything and. The, the worst feeling ever was explaining fly to my opponent who, you know, is newer to the game. And what ended up happening was I had a Harlequin that was underneath kind of like a underneath the vantage to it, but where it was sitting, there was a 40 millimeter circle so that they didn't, weren't going to basically hit as they flew up. They were going to just be able to fly right out. Um, and it was very strange that it was kind of set on this terrain piece like that. Like there was probably like a pipe there or something in, in the past. I don't know. And so because of that, the, the Harlequin was just able to like fly out, kill his leader on one go. Um, yeah, it was, it was bad. And it, and it just like, it was pretty clear. That I was like, maybe Harle you know, Void Dancers is a little too strong. And as a, as a growing community, maybe it's not a faction to play. Um, I think if you have a really well-established community of really good players, and I know, especially down in New York, um, I think that's probably there. But as you're growing your community, maybe maybe if you're the top dog, maybe hold off on playing Harlequins for a little bit. Yeah, having eight super powerful clowns with three APL can feel like a lot until people realize that you have eight wounds and you can die. Yeah, oh, for sure. And, you know, I think there's some some really good matchups for Void Dancers uh, I always found the matchup into particularly when, again, you had fly still um, into Felgors was really strong. Um, I found that the grenade play was really easy to set up. And then because they would end up, you know, bunching up a lot more. And then if you had a really good chance of kind of, you know, chipping them or, or potentially killing them, you were able to kind of move your status up really quickly and then be able to get into, into crits um, for melee, which was really nice. And that kind of, balance that out a little bit into Felgors, um, but you had to play a really cagey game. I found that when I was playing Harlequins, particularly my most challenging matchup, and I'm, I'm eager to kind of try this at some point again, is was Commandos. Commandos was was so hard. Um, the Just a Scratch would really, you know, you'd have a, a good roll, but not a great roll, and then Just a Scratch would ruin it, and then with Choppas, you were just getting getting cleared out. So your eight wound models really didn't model matter too much. Your grenade trick didn't really work too well. Um, that was a really tough matchup, but I, I really enjoyed void dancers. I think they were, you know, they are a really dynamic team. There's a lot there. Um, there's a lot of complexity there. It, you know, as a spoke team or really the, you know, those white dwarf teams, they have a lot there of, of the four. Um, I think that's definitely has been my most fun to play and play against. Um, a Harlequin matchup, uh, a mirror match is maybe the most interesting game you'll you'll play. Like it is, you never know what's going to happen. It's really a blast. It really is the mirror of minds. <laughs> yeah, I do like having interesting mirror matches. I don't love the concept of playing mirror matches in Kill Team, but there are a handful of matchups where 
both players have tools in the tool belt to either go first or second. I know that Star Striders is one that I had a lot of fun with. Vet Guard kind of have it because you can basically get shot at with take cover. Felgor have the ability to do pelting firepower and break the asymmetry in getting charged. So like if you run up to someone and you shoot them, you get one hit in. Suddenly if they charge you, their break points are now terrible because they have to hit you twice or three times and you only have to hit them twice. There's a lot of stuff like that. Void Dancers, because you have the alternating status that can give you cover or extra melee damage, is another example of a spot where as players make choices, if you're really, really playing a game intelligently, you can adjust as people do things, which is fun. Yeah, amusingly, like in general, honestly, if you if you do like a deep dive on mirror matches, there is a lot of like mirror matches that there's such different ways to play that people haven't necessarily always explored that you can really like get get interesting with it. Like, um, I mean, I, I did like a intercession mirror match where my opponent was way shooting heavy and I was way melee heavy. Um, and it was a great, it was super close. It was like, yeah, just squeaking it out like by, by an inch on like a lucky dice roll. But I mean, there's so many different ways to play. Mirror matches can be more interesting than they sound. I think, I think they can be fun to play. They just be slog to have to play them all the time when teams are super popular. Like when commandos were taking up a huge chunk of the meta, it can just be kind of annoying to have to play. Like, all right, I guess we're going to play the commandos all over again. Yeah, well, how I about feel you? Like commandos are a little more one dimensional. How about you, Will? Do you have. So you mentioned Void Dancers being one of your big uh, mirror matches that you enjoyed. Were there other ones that you've experienced as you've come up? Because you have so many of these teams. Yeah, I've, um, I would say mirror matches, um, you know, honestly, I try not to play them as much as possible, but I, you know, it happens in tournaments. Um, mm -hmm. one that was really, really a slog was Phobos into Phobos. Um, and was on beta decima of all things. So, you, you know, it's, it, you know, their most preferred setting, uh, they're really, you know, and both, you know, both players, uh, I took two Reavers, they took two Reavers. Like, it was like, we played an almost an identical team in layout and the loadout and everything. Else. And it, it was a slog. It came down to choosing side on which side was better. And, and, you know, the beta decimal layouts are pretty uh, symmetrical, but in this case, it was layout four. And there's a little bit of a difference between um, where you kind of come up um, to, there's like the middle two pieces there so i was able you know i was able to take the win but it was not you know we both kind of finished it and we were like this was awful this was not a fun experience like let's not have this again whereas the harlequin matchup as uh, chris who's a massachusetts player really great player um we just we happened to get paired up and we were both playing harlequins um i think he had played harlequins that day because i was playing it and he was gonna try to to best me that day so i think that was his plan and we ended up uh, I was able to squeak out the win with a grenade trick and and take the win, which was fun. But uh, he's a really another really great player from our from our region as well. Right, that is excellent. So you've got a ton of players in the New England scene. You want to talk a little bit to, about Ironweld, the upcoming tournament that you're running, or some of the other small scenes uh, and their upcoming events? Yeah, absolutely. So we have. Um, again, we have three places in New England that are running locals um, for folks who are, I think they're, the next closest local is, is New York City. So um, Norton, Massachusetts, which is um, Battlegrounds Norton, uh, is the closest to New York. And um, we they run monthlies there. Um, I want to, They're all on Best Coast Pairing. You know, find all that information. I want to say it's the first or second week of the month that's kind of moved a little bit. Um, and then... We have one afterwards, which is Frexian Life Games in Scarborough. So for folks, if you're in the northern New England area and you're looking for a local, we tend to get this over the summer, especially when people are kind of coming up to Maine and enjoying, you know, the nice weather and the beaches. And they say, man, I really do need to get a little kill team in as well um, or 40K or what have you. We, we have that going on. So come join us. Everyone's welcome. And then um, we still have a Pints and Ponds, which is at the end of the month. Um, and that's in right outside of Portland as well. So we have three really good locals and really great uh, TOs and organizers and, and communities and really good players. 
Um, to speak about Iron Weld, um, so Iron Weld is a massive event. Um, they're running, uh, I think it's like 20 or 30 plus gaming systems all at once. Um, I went to Iron Weld last year um, and actually won the 40K GT. Um, and then this year came around and said, I, I'd like to run the kill team GT. So, um, this is new England. We, we run some GT level events in new England and in, in the past, but it's been a few years. So I'm trying to get the momentum back up and, and get folks to come. And, um, so, uh, all the information is on best coast pairing. The, I'll talk a little bit about the structure of the event, but if you're interested and want to register, you ironweld.com. Uh, um, you would register for the event and then you register for kill team particularly, and then we get added to best coast pairing. So it, it takes a couple of days, but, um, that's the kind of process of that, but for iron Weld itself, I, I, we're running a six, uh, six round event. So two days, um, we're going to be running two hour, two hour rounds, um, in our mission packet, there's a, you can find on best coast pairing has all the information of what, what order the missions are going to run in. Um, all those pieces. Um, I think this was the particularly interesting thing. And I'm, I'm curious what you guys think about this is talking about terrain. So I think as a tournament organizer and kind of new to the scene, um, I had the opportunity to go to the New York open this past year and had a lot of fun. And I, I think one of the things that I'm, I'm discovering as a, as a, as a new tournament organizer to, to kill team, particularly, there's a lot of ways to do terrain. And, um, and so that becomes kind of a challenge is to what's the best way of doing terrain. And so as the new England community, we have, we have been using um, turning point um, for all of our events um, with the exception of this, I forget the name of the story in Massachusetts. Um, but for our, most of our events, we are running turning point um, or we're using GW's uh, beta decima rules packet right now that's out there so we we are running um we're going to be running into the dark we're going to be running um open boards and we're going to be running beta decima and i i know for the people have asked me what's the percentage of board types so the relative percentage right now is 20 percent um to 20 percent itd 20 percent beta um, and then the, the remaining 60% is going to be open board. And the reason we broke that out is I think in the New England meta, we actually play a lot of beta decima, which I know is not very popular for a lot of folks outside of New England. So I wanted to make sure that we were accommodating. And so that if someone you end up playing a round on beta decima, it might not be your favorite. You'll have an opportunity to play on an open board or play on ITD afterwards. Um, we're doing uh with that being said we have a uh we have a couple of pieces there of of prizes so we're gonna have some more information to come but we're gonna have a first second third place prize we're hoping to maybe give out some cool gw goodies i might have uh, a, a hammer to hand out a demon hammer to hand out um but we're also going to be uh judging um also a painting as well so if you have a really cool painted army uh, kill team come bring it and we want to show it off and win some prizes yeah, I think as far as terrain goes, as long as people kind of know what's happening up front, I think it's generally fine. I haven't loved Beta Decima mostly because I do find it very restrictive as far as which maps are actually good to play. I think five and six are not the best, although I will say that I like swimming and I will probably push that. So if you guys are down to play it with swimming, maybe there would be more reason for me to want to try to come up. I want to throw just one more thing in. Like. Swimming, yeah. yes, big thumbs up. Also, make all of the ladders cost two inches less to climb. I'm in. It's 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 funny in uh, in in uh, battlegrounds in Norton when Beta came out. Uh, I think we had a, a tournament it was twelve players, so we had six tables and four of them were Beta Decima, and two two of them were uh, I think Open Border and ITD. So we all had to play a lot of Beta Decima that day, and we had the the week prior had a massive in Maine. We had a tournament as well, and we only had one table set up of of I think six of Beta. And everyone who had played it was like in Maine. We're like, we don't want to play this. This is awful. And we went down to our our friends in Massachusetts and played down there and said, we'll give it another try and we'll go we'll go. 
And I think the problem, the, the thing that's really interesting about beta is that the GW layouts, you really got to be particular about them. I think my particular favorite layout is four. I think four is really great. Um, I think the thing with with Beta Decima is as the community comes together to try to maybe solve this problem of how best to utilize the train or decides we're not going to use it, um, as the folks who are kind of looking at how do we adapt it, I think the challenge that right now is like as an organizer is how do we add those components to to a terrain set? And so right now, uh, you know, open we can say is that we are only playing the beta decima, so we are not using the. Um, oh gosh, it's not it's not critical. Is it critical role? Oh, one of the. Uh, can you roll a crate? Can you roll a crate? Yeah, yeah. He, he has a really great terrain set combo when I used the other day, but I think some pieces there that I think could be modified. And I think, right, I think everyone's kind of working on that and trying to figure that out. And so we're going to utilize beta decima that might be, you know, and it might, it might be another failure. It might be a piece that, you know, people leave in the event and say, hey, that's, that wasn't my, my favorite type of terrain. Can we, moving forward, if we run a major in, in the New England area, can we not use that? And we probably won't if that's, if that's the sentiment. Um, I think that's the thing that we have to figure out. And I think the terrain and kill team is really interesting. Um, as I kind of tell people about uh, kill team and new players as they come in, from my experience with, with 40K, when I when I think about a codex coming out, it, it really changes the meta. It really would change how we play and adapt to that. The codexes, I feel like in, in kill team are really the terrain sets that come out because they're just so dynamic on how they're played and adapted to and i think the other piece to it as well as asymmetrical terrain as well really changes up that as as even more so so we're eager in our our local to start implementing a little bit of asymmetrical terrain as well and trying to figure that out um and we've we've colloquially called it new york style which is probably not the correct name but uh it, it feel like uh, you know new york is such a an epicenter of the kill team community and meta and and you know does so much great work for for the greater game so as us mainers we've been calling it the new york style up there so but um we're eager to try to learn more about that and i think you know as we look at terrain it's really fun to try new things and try new different styles and if it doesn't go it doesn't work it doesn't work that's okay and we'll try something different yeah i think I think that the one of the cool things, one of the coolest parts about Kill Team from all of their other game systems is that the terrain rule set is robust enough where you really don't actually need to use a terrain set, which does open up a lot of room. I know that most TOs have basically standardized their terrain kits, and I think that's fine because the plastic terrain is there, but there is a much richer gameplay experience that exists in the rule set that you don't need the terrain for and you can just mix and match which things you like you know having scramble piles with chow terrain definitely creates some novel situations and being able to think on your feet is definitely one of the parts that i like the most and it's definitely why i don't love having tons of terrain packets just because it does linearize the thought process around the games like now that all of the mid boards are so dense generally melee teams run up to the middle and they either kill enough things where they can push through to the other side or the shooting teams shoot them to death in the middle of the board and the game is over on the middle of the board. And I don't super love that. Can I ask you guys a question about terrain as we kind of talk about this in the events? So in, in 40K, in, in 8th edition, terrain was not standardized. It became standardized towards the end of the run of 8th edition when we went to the LVOLs, particularly, as they tried to kind of standardize some terrain and, and what that looked like on competitive play, particularly. And then when 9th edition came around for 40K, it, it was standardized. This is what it, you know, this is how, you know, this is what it looks like. This is how it is. This is all the layouts for that. Do you think, and you guys, do you guys think that? Kill Team will go in that direction as they go to potentially a new edition in, in the years to come? Or do you think 
kill team will always be a game where it's Murray, um, the ability to kind of the, the complexity of train is much better than 40k. So you can always kind of mix and match how you want to do it. Do you think what, do you think that will remain to be the case or do you think we'll push to a standardized layout? I think we're we're heading more and more to a standardized, and that's kind of like shown off by Into the Dark and Beta Decima both like gave us like specific layouts, um, and like all the season one stuff was kind of like it wasn't there, and then people kind of started to standardize it, and then the next seasons came out and kind of standardized it. But I think there's going to be like a whole world of casual play and like narrative play where people do all this goofy stuff because there is like. There are a lot of people that love that are just 100 percent only here for narrative play, and like especially like my local scene really like shows that off. Where um, we we have a lot more people that are here for casual games, narrative play, stuff like that, than like um, tournament play. So there there is going to be a whole giant element of like the underground like narrative kind of stuff. But I think tournament wise, it is going to like shift more and more to standardized like tournament like you can study it like people won't be caught off guard type thing i think ultimately gw is in the business of making money and selling terrain kits is always going to be a nice chunk of change for them so if they can they will i think that the rule set is robust enough where we don't need to do that and i personally like the dynamism of that obviously some people don't like that they don't know what the terrain sets are and they can't metagame them but nobody does which is which is part of what i like doing so that's just how we've been running tournaments in new york and hopefully we'll see where gw goes they i would kind of expect they are going to standardize terrain over time it is just easy money for them and it also takes the blame off of gw once the or it takes the it takes the blame off of tos because i do think that one of the rough parts about being a to who's willing to make their own layouts is that players can blame you at the end of the day instead of blaming gw which is something that you just have to be okay with taking the responsibility for sometimes people have a negative play experience because they didn't see that there was a blast window that you know is there or the mandrakes had some crazy line but it's also kind of impossible at this point to build the perfect terrain layout that doesn't let some team do something no i I completely agree. I think that's that's the I think that's the big challenge. And I think even I, I go back to 40k a lot, but in in the 40k scene, right? Even still, um, go even when they standardize kind of layouts, how thick the terrain was, if there were windows, if there was this, if there were that, um, really added to that, right? And and so because of that, it ended up that you would run run an event and if your bottom floor didn't have the windows blocked out, you know, people would come in and, and be really frustrated about that or make, you know, table decisions and and not communicate with TOs and those kind of things. So I think, I think with kill team, you, you're going to always, you know, trains is such a huge part of the game. It's, it's, it's the part that I, I really love a lot. It, you know, when you set up a chow F board and get everything out there, um, you know, it really looks phenomenal and it's fun and, it, and it's very thematic and exciting to play. Um, so I think it's, it's interesting. I, I was to look at how, how do we make tables look good? How do we make tables be playable spaces, but also how do we make tables be interesting? And I think what I'm curious right now as a, as a kind of young TO to kill team particularly is learning more and more communities about that. And I, and I admire how communities are sharing that information and in, in pictures and tournaments and all sorts of stuff out there. And it's really helpful for a small community, like in Maine, as we're, we're trying to figure out what's the best way to play and, and always trying something new and different. So I appreciate all the communities out there and their ability to do that. All right. Yeah. I mean, I think at the end of the day, every community kind of plays its own way. You know, Spanish boards have their own biases. UK boards have their own biases and the US boards have their own biases, depending on which TO is running things. So being able to experiment is really important. Having some maps that are just going to be other people's map packs is totally fine. But don't hesitate as a player to experiment a little bit outside the bounds. 
I would not say that you should play player place terrain though. That is the my only exception. Is player place <laughs> terrain is a is a whole separate meta game that I think is a trash <laughs> meta game. So don't do that. We tried that at Nova two years ago. It was terrible. And uh, I, yeah, I would just not not do that. That's the only thing I would say not to do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I I think it is amusing that like there kind of is like no right answer with terrain, which is like half of what makes it super fun. Um, I'm not as 100 percent opposed to player place terrain, but you know, I I haven't done it in a while. But that was like my my local club was founded on it. But we're a bunch of like casuals that are here to like. You know, just like play I games are fun the, and no one the was big abusing thing about it. Player really. place terrain is that there are certain matchups where you're like, oh, well, I'm not really going to win this game in most cases, like Felgor Pathfinder. So instead of trying to set up a board where people have fun, you just put all the terrain on one side and you just roll a die. You're like, well, if I win, I win. If I lose, I lose. Because <laughs> it's it's an easy, it's a fifty fifty chance versus the other chance of having to run the whole game where you you got to shoot a guy fifteen times to finish the game off so i think there's just like some to- more toxic elements where at least if you have the terrain there people have to- are forced to play and like but like by now there's there's six objectives always and i feel like it's leveled out a little bit we're like originally the missions i think we're a little more toxic with player plays we haven't revisited it in the in the local pack but uh, travis hates it i don't completely hate it but i'm like mm, yeah there's a <laughs> there's a better option um but uh i don't know I'm willing to. I'm, I'm now that we mentioned it. I'm like hmm, maybe I'd revisit it for a couple of practice games. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, thanks for coming on to the podcast. As we coming out after you've got some big life events going on, we've got the Iron World coming up next month. You've got tons of New England stuff. So looking forward to seeing pictures. And for anyone who's in the New England area or in the New York area or the Rochester area, Shane, if you're listening. Maybe it's time to go take a visit to Ironweld. We'd love to have you guys and we're excited. We're excited to have everyone come and join us and hopefully more events to come in New England. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. Thank you listeners for listening until the end. Um, I assume that everyone that has listened to the end spends their free time tiptoeing around on mountains because you're a bunch of goats. We love you. 